Good morning. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I'm excited to be here. I want you to be excited, too. Hey, I'm uh, from a nearby area. I'm from Gary, and I went to law school and graduate school at Valparaiso University. So I know the region pretty well. And so when I got the call about coming back here today to speak, I was quite excited. I read a lot, and uh, as I was preparing, I found this quote by a gentleman named Thomas Wolfe that says, you can't go home again. And I got nervous. <laughs> like, well, can I go back? How are they going to receive me? Is anyone going to like what I had to say? So I want you to hold your thoughts about that to the end, because I'm going to ask you later. But since I've been gone from here, I've had an opportunity to speak to countless numbers of parents, teachers, students, administrators, coaches. And what I've found thus far, my observation has been that people are not all that optimistic about Generation Z. In fact, just recently, I had an opportunity to uh, attend a book signing. Well, I was the person signing the books. And while we were discussing the book, parents and grandparents were talking a lot about your generation. And again, they weren't optimistic. In fact, there was quite a bit of pessimism being spoken. And then a few days ago, I had an opportunity. It was invited by a school to come speak and met with some teachers and, and some administrators. And they, too, seemed to find it sort of a chore to say things that are good about this generation. Now, in two ways, that's upsetting to me. One is because I have a son who's a member of Generation Z, and I think he's phenomenal. And most of his friends whom I met are pretty phenomenal as well. Not as phenomenal as him, because he's mine. <laughs> but the second reason that I'm disturbed is that it brings back memories about when I was a child. See, I'm a member of the Generation X, and my parents were baby boomers. And so I would always hear about how I had it easy, especially from my father that I wasn't as tough as his generation. I also had a high school guidance counselor who told me that the best that I could hope to do was to join the military. And no discredit to anyone who was in the armed forces, he wasn't saying that as a compliment. He actually thought that the only person who would be interested in taking me to do anything in life would have been someone who had to take me. So given all the things that I've heard about this generation, I thought that I could share with you uh, what, what those thoughts were in four words. And I've categorized those four words this way. Impatient, distracted, entitled, apathetic. And those four words make up an acronym we're going to call IDEA. And speaking of IDEA, I have an idea. The ideal is that we should, parents, grandparents, elders, we should tell the truth about Generation Z. Generation Z is impatient, distracted, entitled, and apathetic, but not the way you think they are. Generation Z is impatient because they are the first digital generation. And we've spent a lifetime providing them electronic devices that add extra dopamine to their brains, that cause them, whether or not you know this or not, to be addicts of instant gratification. Generation Z is distracted because we've left them a planet that's a mess. And they have to solve everything. Global warming, race and gender discrimination, food insecurity, homelessness, just to name a few. Wouldn't you be distracted when you have so many things to do? Where do we start? Generation Z is entitled. Yes, entitled to the same self-evident truths that's promised in the Declaration of Independence. Unfortunately, the way we've left the planet, it's unlikely that any of them will ever experience life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And finally, Generation Z is apathetic. Of course they are, because they've also spent a lifetime of us feeding them food that makes them brain dead and puts them in poor physical health. So why would anyone want to get up off the couch when the food that they've eaten causes them to want to sleep? And given what we do politically and the choices we make as parents and the government officials that we elect to represent our children, why even bother? So yes, Generation Z is impatient, distracted, entitled, and apathetic. That's the truth. But the other part of the truth is we've caused that. Now, simply telling you what I believe to be the truth is not nearly enough. I was told by a psychologist, because I need therapy right about now, that the first step to recovery is admission. So I'm admitting that we've created a mess. And the second step is to apologize. So I want to apologize to all the members of Generation Z for whatever part I played in making this world a mess. And the third step is to give us some solutions about how to move forward. But where do we start? 
Well, we start with this guy, my favorite generation is here, my son Naeem. Hey, isn't he cute? You can say, aw. <laughs> He's not that cute anymore. He's 21 now. <laughs> But we'll start with his story, because in his story, the first few moments of his life, the first few days of his life, will give us some indications about the challenges that exist for your generation and some of the ways for us to triumph. And those ways that I'm going to explain this are going to come in three parts. The first part is called moldable. The second part is called perseverance. And the third part is called lionheart. So let's begin with the first part. When you hear the word moldable, you think of what? Moldy cheese? Moldy bread? Mildew? Some type of fungus? No, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about mold as in the shape of his head. So my son was born June 27, 1995. And this is the part of the story where I call, could call it language because of the things my wife said in the delivery room. See, I had the video camera and I was trying to get everything videoed and she was yelling and screaming because of the labor she was going through and she wanted me to put the camera down. When my son was born, he was born with a cone head. I mean, a really pointy cone head. I am not exaggerating. If his head had been orange, he could have stopped traffic. In fact, I think I have a picture from the delivery room. There it is. What I found out from the doctor is that it is not unusual for children to be born with a, with a cone head. That the birth process and coming through the birth canal adds extra pressure and the skull is soft and, and the babies oftentimes are born with elongated or differently shaped heads. So my son was one of those people. But here's the cool thing that happened. The doctor picked my baby up, caressed his head, and shaped his head into a perfectly beautiful round head. Now, if I could channel my inner President Trump for a moment, I would tell you this. He had the most beautiful head in all the world. I mean, people are telling me, everywhere people are telling me that he has the most beautiful head. Trust me, I'm hearing, I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> He had the most beautiful head in all the world. Almost as beautiful as mine, follically challenged. <laughs> Beautifully round head, come on people. <laughs> but in those moments, here's what I learned, seriously. I learned that children are like this sign under construction. And it's the responsibility of parents to make sure that we form and shape a world for children that can be beautiful. Because in that moment, when I was worried about how my child was going to look. I wasn't worried if he was going to live. I wasn't worried if he was going to have some disability. I was worried about what people were going to say about my child. In that moment, I realized that if a doctor could form, reform, reshape bone, skull, that parents can reshape children's lives to be something that allows them to change the world. The second thing, second part is called perseverance. So on my, ninth, my son's third day of, of life, we packed him up to take him to see my father. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my father and I don't necessarily have the greatest relationship, but I was hopeful that the story I'm told about grandparents loving their grandchildren more than they love their children, I was hoping that that was going to be true. So we packed him up, and we thought we'd take him over to see his grandfather. And so we arrived at the house. I ring the doorbell, and I've got this, my newborn, roundly shaped head baby in my hand. And my father comes to the door, and I take my son and say, hey, Dad, this is your grandson. This is Naeem. And my father extends his hands like that. And I remember it like it happened yesterday. He said, get that baby away from me. I don't like babies. Bring him back when he's 21. This is not melodramatic. I felt my heart break. This was my flesh and blood. This was my hope that I would somehow build this bridge between this discontentment my father and I shared with each other. But my father pushed my son away as if he had some type of disease and he was worried about him starting a pandemic. My father pushed him away as if he was imagining that it was his responsibility to be the first one to denounce Generation Z. And over the years, my heart still breaks because I would love for my son to have a grandfather. But he doesn't. But anymore, I'm not so much worried about my son because his life is great. I'm worried about all the other children who I see, their parents and grandparents and elders and community members doing the same thing, slamming the door. Slamming the door in your faces like this, rejecting you. And I wonder why that's the case. So when my grandmother was alive, she lived from 19, 
2008 to 2012, 103 years, I had a chance to ask her these kind of questions about my dad. Why does my father seem to suggest his generation was so much more uh, brave than mine? Why does he suggest that uh, things were so much more difficult for him than me? And my grandmother would say, you know what, your dad has revisionist history. And she would laugh. He has no idea what difficult times were. I was born in 1908. My grandmother had the privilege of knowing her ancestors who were slaves, as well as meeting her last ancestor who was born in 2010, which was a member of Generation Alpha. So when I'd ask my grandmother if my father was suffering revisionist history, I had to trust her. She knew what she was talking about. After all, she had seen Jim Crow, the Great Depression, World Wars I and II, uh, segregation, the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Liberation Movement, the Peace Movement, the Great Recession, 9-11, you name it, she saw it. So if she said that your parents suffer from revisionist history, she knew what she was talking about. There's one other thing my grandmother would have wanted me to tell you. She would have wanted me to tell you this. Well, that we should start a new social movement on her behalf. Has and hashtag and grandma we trust. Because if she said it to be true, then it must be true. But seriously, here's the other thing she would have wanted you to know. She would have wanted you to know the, par the, sto the parable of the tree and the fruit, which is that every tree is known by its own fruit. So what does that mean? Well, Generation Z, you need to understand, so you can tell your parents this, that for whatever you are or not, you are or not that because of your parents. You need to be able to tell elders that for whatever you are or whatever you're not, when you're criticized, you're not choosing to be criticized. We've subjected you to criticism. And if I could channel my inner Pee Wee Herman, anyone know him? Uh, a daytime TV show host from the 80s. I would tell Generation Z to tell your parents in the tone that they can remember, I know you are, but what am I? And the last part is called Lionhearted. So what does that mean? Well, the day nine was born, the following day on the 28th, we get a notification from the hospital, and they tell us, you have to go home. Yeah, I mean, really, you have to go home. They say, they don't let you stay but 24 hours. So I called the limousine service to pick up my son, and just as you see here, there was a red carpet, and the paparazzi were there. And they wanted to find out how they reshaped this little baby's head. But seriously, there was a limousine that showed up, picked up my son, because, of course, I had had his head squozen by a doctor. This is the least I could do was get him a limousine ride. So we put him in the limousine, and I'm, I have a car seat for the very first time, and I'm strapping the car seat in, and it dawns on me that I have more instructions about how to put a car seat in than to be a parent. See, we're taking all the Lamaze classes. We learn how to eat ice chips, or at least my wife did. Uh, we learn how to pluff up pillows and how to breathe. But what we hadn't learned how to be a parent. See, Lamaze taught you how to give birth, but no one ever taught you how to be a parent. And I learned pretty soon that I didn't know how to be a parent because only hours later we had to feed him for the first time. So we fed him, or she did, because she breastfed him, and it had been odd for me to try to do it. <laughs> she breastfed him and, and burped him, and, and we walked with him and expected him to go to sleep because that's what it, babies are supposed to do, but he didn't go to sleep. He just cried and cried and cried. And her being exhausted, she looked at me and she extends the baby to me, sort of like I extended it to my father. In that moment, I had a decision that I was going to make. I wanted to say, what are you doing? I don't know anything about babies. But then I thought about Mufasa. I was like, man, what would Mufasa do? WWMD. <laughs> would Mufasa push the baby away? No, only Tommy would do that. So I took my baby and I did what Mufasa would do. I cuddled him, and I put his heart, put his head to my heart so he could hear my heart. And in that moment, I realized the connection. And you know what happened? My son went to sleep. And nearly every day for the first several days of his life, that's exactly what we did. I would lay on my back, I would put his ear to my heart, and he would go to sleep. And here's what I learned from that. I learned, parents, that your children need to be connected to you at the heart. Every day, in every way, from zero to 100, they need to be connected to you at the heart. In fact, I contend that the only way society will move forward is when parents and children remain connected at the heart. So now we're back where we started. 
where I apologize once again, Generation Z. To, for, on behalf of all the old grumpy folks that you come in contact with, I apologize because we've let you down, but we're going to do better. And to all the old grumpy folks, I want to leave you with three things. Remember that your children's lives are under construction, and you have the power to reshape and remold their lives in a way that allows them to move this planet forward. Number two, I'm fond of this quote, you are not who you believe you are. You are not who you think others believe you are. You are exactly who your children consider you to be. And finally, we all owe our children a responsible plan that allows them to achieve excellence. And we must love them with all our heart the way Mufasa loves Simba. And lastly, here's my question where I started. Can I please come home again? Thank you. <laughs>